Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards. Because we are the best. And we're not wizards. No matter what anybody says. Goodbye. Hello and welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for April. Or maybe it's still March. We don't know. We've no idea. I'm pretty sure I don't sure need you interrupting me when I'm doing my intro. <laughs> regardless of how absolutely important you think that you are and the number of times that you've been on the show that makes you think that you can just jump in straight away without me doing my intro which is going to be you know it's highly organized it's well thought out it's planned in meticulous detail and now you've just ruined it so no start again? what's the point there's no point in starting again we've got to seize the moment we don't know what's going to be around the corner we don't know if we you know if we're going to be you know, going out and trying and getting ourselves some toilet paper and we think it's okay but then we're going to end up fighting for survival we don't know. It's all unknown. So I thought... There, c- there could be zombies there could just be- outside. Stop up interrupting. There could be only one thing to do in this era. is to get involved in era survival. And maybe check out an expansion into the unknown. But not just the first time. Maybe the second time. Because uh, <laughs> joining me from Shades of Vengeance... I've got Captain Interrupt Us. Captain been on the show so many times he can think he can just like start talking as soon as he can. He put the he puts the joy in the jibbit and he puts the education in the ed. It's Ed Jibbit. Yeah. Well, that's probably the best cheer I've had in quite a while. <laughs> I'll be honest. I don't I don't get very many cheers. I don't. But thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be back as always. <laughs> Fantastic. It's decidedly average to be here. Um, you know, um, how are you doing anyway? How are you? How are you? How are uh, you? How I are am. You? Oh man, C- coronavirus. It, it's weird, isn't it? Like you, you, you look out the window and you can see what you'd see on a normal day, and you're just kind of like, well, I can't go out there. I can't go out and buy toilet paper. You know. Um, what on what on earth am I going to do? Do I have enough? Am I going to run out? These are the thoughts that now are the centre of our existence. You could use a cloth. Um, I've been. Uh, I've. I'm just saying. <laughs> you could I use suppose, a cloth. I suppose that's t- a fair point. Terry Towling. I mean, everybody's um, got towels. Everybody, everybody has uh, got uh, that one big fluffy beach towel in their cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> in the in the airing cupboard that they don't use. I'm just saying you could probably cut up that bad boy a little bit or you could just leave it and you could use a bit at a time. And it's hot water. You can give it a good scrub (laughs) and you're fine. (laughs) Okay, so toilet paper on one side. Um, There's obviously the sanity aspect, which is really important. Um, And I can see how well you're doing with that particular aspect of the sanity thing. Oh, this is my time. Um, I don't think you understand them perfectly made for this type of experience you know I think I'm Uh kind of this is me coming into my own I mean I look forward because what happens is that normally on a day to day basis like most day to day things you you kind of you'll meet people and you'll interact with people sometimes positively sometimes negatively Uh and then if you're in the situation where you are working from home which so many of us as and less fortunate people are in the situation where they're at home anyway but they've you know currently they're furloughed or whatever then it's almost like Mm. I am the kind of it's almost like somebody has pretty much taken um, you know a bottle of Pepsi 
and uh, got some of those mentors and what they've done is they've they've pretty mm. much put that the mentors into the Pepsi and shaking the bottle and they're waiting for it to explode except I can't do that during the day I can't you know I because during the day I can't have conversations with clients in the same way that I have conversations with wonderful talented fantastic people in the tabletop industry and obviously yourself and you know and so I, I yeah yeah plus, plus myself like as a separate <laughs> item there, yeah. it's in brackets in parentheses as they would as they would call it <laughs> So you get to a point where you're like, well, I'm looking forward to this. This is my chance to, you know, to, to then spring forth and stuff like that. And it's difficult because it is, it is, mm. it's, it's a tricky time for a lot of people. It's a lot of people. I know exactly what you mean. I'm... You go on. I was actually giving you a chance uh, to speak. No, I, I was, normally I would interrupt. So, <laughs> as you were going to say, I am pretty um, much usually yeah, no, do I, speak I over exactly people. What you... <laughs> <laughs> but what were you gonna say? Okay. <laughs> what I was saying was, um, I've I've actually been uh, running games on our Discord every really? day. Um, we're running a game at six p.m. Mm-hmm. every day with me. Uh, one of the rest of my team has stepped up, and he runs a game at ten p.m. most days. Wow. Um, and we're just we're just running Era Survival, Era the Consortium, Era the Empowered, Era the Chosen, you name it, we're running it. Um, I'm running a Forbidden at the weekend, um, which of course is the last time that we spoke, isn't it? Um, Era Forbidden. Um, uh, they all kind of merge together, speaking so, to you, to be perfectly honest. As I say, I've got to remind myself, they're all fabulous all... and wonderful experiences. I look back on it, kind of like... Um, if people had like a flashback, but it was a nice flashback where they were maybe playing about with their favourite dog or something like that. That's how I kind of view our previous encounters. But yeah, I think uh, people are trying to find some kind of um, normality. There's something very, mm. there's something yeah. very, very amazing about the human race being able to to crave banality as the point is like very much like an anchor point in the world to the point where. You know, I was sitting there thinking to myself, I was I was um going through my podcast list of podcasts that I like to, to listen to. And I was amazed that actually what I haven't been doing is I haven't been listening to as many shows and then I reason I came to that, you know, and then the conclusion was that you know, I was like, Oh, well, the shows are just stacking up and, and, and the reason behind it was that I usually would listen to shows in the morning on the commute and then I would listen to some at lunchtime and then I would mention, listen to some on the way home and yep. then if I went to the shops I would have it plugged yep. in and I'd be listening and that would allow me to get potentially through like three or four podcasts a day you know and now I'm sitting there and you know yeah, and no, now um, you're just sat here and, and you can work the whole time you can do your audio editing which I assume you have to do a lot of on, on We're Not Wizards um, to to sort of cut out the bits where I sound like an idiot no. and yeah no 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 I I get it one hundred percent I'm exactly the same I'm suddenly finding I don't have time to do the stuff that I would normally just do on or an I miss basis. just the banality of actually do you know what I miss I miss a I miss a traffic jam Ed do you know what I mean um, I kind of miss I miss the kind of the parking I miss queues and stuff I miss kind of maybe you know the queue on the bridge because you got to sit around and if you were sitting about it, you got to contemplate stuff. I'm in traffic, but that's okay because my mind's at rest. I don't need to be concentrating on driving too much because I'm in a traffic jam and we're going slowly. And it was never for a long time. I'm not talking about hour long traffic jams. It was generally a traffic mm. jam that lasted like maybe five or six minutes. Nothing major. My commute's generally quite, quite easy, but I'm kind of missing the ability to kind of to do that and now it's kind of indoors and and you know I kind of miss the banality and the, the boringness of doing these certain you know going things like um running out of milk in the office and just going for that wander across the roads to Lidl and and having a wander about and you know standing about with other people it's very very strange kind of situation but anyway you know as I say it's like you yeah know. no I know what you mean I think Oh, sorry. No, I mean, I was just, you know, trying to catch you out again, so you would try and 
kind of interrupt in kind of some kind of strange way. So it worked. So that was quite good. Anyway, what were you going to say? I know what you mean because I, I know what you mean because we, you know, I, I I've done a lot of studying of what it takes to be creative. Yeah. And a big part of what it actually takes to be creative is that downtime that you're talking about, Mm -hmm. right? And the problem is that, okay, maybe you get in the shower or, you know, whatever, you know, you you have a couple of minutes here and there. But as you say, it's having these breaks throughout the day. And when you're sat at your computer, you're working from home, you don't have a reason to be distracted by Jim walking past and going, Mm, hey, how you doing? You having a good day? No one's no one's asking you that question anymore. You know, maybe at the beginning of a meeting, but by then you're in a meeting, so you know you're having this audio conversation with a client or or, or with a with a colleague, but you're not having this. I'd almost say this distraction is as big a part of being creative because you have those minutes of downtime when you're not focusing on the thing that you're trying to create, and your subconscious is working away back there, and you're. The front of your mind is just letting it do its thing. Somebody said to me today, it says like, um, they were used to be somebody who was totally never understood when they played games like Bioshock or any games that you would be able to go about and you would find kind of audio logs which would tell the story as to how civilization eventually collapsed. And now they're like, no, I totally get it. I was, you know, I completely understand how people try to make things kind of normal until it kind of goes a bit too far. And, you know, things are going to be, and, and, and things are going to get better and everything like that. But people are generally kind of like documenting their thoughts and their fears and, and what they're thinking about things. So if we did, you know, if if you if next thing the meteor strikes and then somebody wakes up and they try to discover, piece together what kind of happened to us, they would now start to find audio logs everywhere. And it's like, but that's never going to happen. It's like, well, actually, actually it kind of is. People are still creating content and they're creating, they're putting their thoughts down there and they're putting down their private messages. So it's kind of, kind of interested. I guess what I'm getting around to is the fact that um, it does, in many ways, make your particular game a little bit more of a fantasy <laughs> than maybe what people were kind of expecting. But um, no, and I mean, joking aside, um, Era Survival is part of your Era D10 system and for people who haven't kind of listened before era d10 system is a um is your system your role-playing system that you've rolled out to countless different um stories and worlds and 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 systems nowadays and um you're funded which is always nice um Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um were you surprised at that i don't mean are you surprised i'm not saying (laughs) Be self-deprecating and say, well, why would anybody give us money? But are you surprised that given the current situation that, um, you know, you're like, oh, I'm sitting there and funded. Yeah, everything seems to be quite cushy. You've still got a couple of weeks to go until the kind of the end of the campaign. So is that kind of a nice kind of place to be in at the moment? So I, you will undoubtedly remember a few of these I've done in the yeah. past. In fact, I think... And we're going back three years oh. now, but I think I came and spoke to you at the original Era Survival Expansions into the Unknown. Potentially. Um, three years ago. It all goes into a I, I think I did. Uh, and if anyone, if anyone's listening, uh, like, like, let Richard know in the comments that that you know I'm 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 right <laughs> because I'm pretty sure I'm right. Okay. okay. Just saying. Um. So the thing is that that with my Kickstarters like mm. this. Um, all of these are about a big surge forward in the size of the universe. That's what we're mm-hmm. aiming for. So, when when you've got, you know, uh, when you've got funded, that's fantastic. It's a great first step. Don't let me try and you know, I'm not trying to minimise it in any way, but it's it's nowhere near where I want to get to. Um, so. £3,000, the funded goal, unlocks three expansions. It's going to be Aqua, it's going to be Encounters en Route, it's going to be Diaries of Madman. They're all fantastic. Um, I think that they bring something to the post-apocalyptic genre, whether it's era survival or not. So I think I think that they're you know really contributing in that sense, particularly Encounters en Route. Um, 
But what I want to do is I want to bring more books into the world for Era Survival. That's that's always my mm-hmm. goal. That's always what I'm going for. And so, you know, I consider my work maybe half done at this point. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to see this Kickstarter hit five, 6,000. Because then we're bringing you some campaign books. We're bringing you the Settlements and People expansion. You know, maybe we stretch forward and we do the future, which is something we'd, we'd love to do. We want to set an expansion 100 years after Era Survival. And what does it look like? Because we said humanity would be pretty much extinct in 100 mm-hmm. years. So what will it look like? What will it actually be like to play in that world? And we want to set an expansion there. That's a stretch goal I haven't even put a number on yet. Um, There are so many things that we want to be doing. And yeah, it's fantastic to be funded. Um, We were made a project we love by Kickstarter, which, um, as I'm sure you know very well, um, is not, you know, it's not something you get to do every time. Uh, I've, I've, this, assuming that we continue on course and, and we are indeed funded... This will be my 54th funded Kickstarter. Um, and I've had a project we love, I think, four times? Yeah. In that? Yeah. Um, so it's it's not something that happens every time. And, and therefore, to me, it's still a big deal every time. You know, I, I mean, I, I do see some companies come out and everything they release is a project we love. I mean, cool, great. I'm happy for them. Good on you guys. Keep mm-hmm. going. Keep mm-hmm. doing that mm-hmm. thing. But, um, you know, for me, it's a big deal, you know, and, and it makes a huge difference to the to the campaigns that I run because I know that more people will see it, more people are going to back it, more people are going to join in and try to reach those stretch goals. And the thing about this campaign is as we reach those stretch goals, every backer gets everything, right? So we unlock another expansion, yeah, everyone yeah. gets it. Um and and that's that's awesome because that could mean that if we do get to say six thousand, I'm giving every single person who backed, even the ones who backed at the start and thought, well, maybe we get three, I'm giving them six expansions. This is it's never been I mean, you know, listeners who've heard me before know, it's never been about trying to make loads and loads of money for me. It's about building these worlds and bringing this content to the people who want to hear about it, who want to read it, who want to experience yeah, that yeah. world or a world like it of mm-hmm. their own design. Okay. Okay. So for people who haven't delved into era survival, is it is it the kind of the typical post apocalyptic kind of jaunt or what's your kind of your angle what's your kind of catch why people why should people consider this over you know any other kind of ripaga books which are kind of out there so era survival is actually unique as far as i know um and as far as anyone else has commented in one particular way instead of being immediately after the zombie apocalypse It's set a hundred years later, right? No one really remembers what happened. No one really cares. You know, life is what it is now. You know, you're not going to cure the infection. You're not going to change people from zombies back into normal people or even dead people, um, except by doing it the hard way. Um, Life Mm. is over, right? And, And humanity is just this dying species. But humanity, and, and, and this is... I've been asked a few times, you know, is there any relevance to our current situation? Obviously, you've alluded to it slightly as well. Humanity has this tendency to pull together for what individuals want when they have a common Mm -hmm. interest. And in Era Survival, I've taken that to kind of an extreme. So in this game, there are 14 factions, each of which has a different idea on how to survive the post-apocalypse. So some factions think, no, 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 it's better that everyone dies rather than becomes infected. Um, So they literally go around killing people. All right, okay. Right? There are people who are mad maxi and sort of go raid-a-tastic and try and steal things from people as well. They're a different faction. Um, There are factions that believe that the infection is the next progression for humanity and and you know you must become infected and we'll all be greater as a result of it you know there are the crazies um there are the people who want to harness the infection for for their own purposes there are the people who want to hide underground and and like live in bunkers um and just stay away from all the infection and all the danger 
Um, there are the people who want to, um, you know, find a cure, and and they literally lock themselves away in a bunker. Um, and and this university of planet they call themselves. They they just search for a cure all the time. Um, there are people who want to cure, uh, not cure, heal as many people as possible and keep people alive through this zombie apocalypse so that they don't die. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, you know, that those, you know, they literally give medicines to people freely, whoever they are and so on and so on and so on and so on. So there are 14 different factions that I've created, uh, plus the infected makes 15, um, and you know, no matter which which faction that you're interacting with, it's quite likely that there are going to be aspects of what they're doing that you can mm. get behind. Uh, there's a faction that thinks that burning everything in sight is probably the best way to get rid of the infection. And let's face it, they're probably right. Um, so, so you've they, got you know they have got that kind of different of scope. Then. So it's kind of like different scope for different folks. And if people can kind of like approach this, and they can yeah. form their own version of the apocalypse based on how they would want to run it. So is that what you had in kind of mind that a DM could pick this up and say, well, actually what I want is I want a fairly kind of passive kind of uh, situation here. Or they will you say, well, I want it to have kind of like 100% high octane action from kind of like the outset. Then you're giving them those different factions that rather than them having a take, say like a faction and, twist it and stuff like that to make it their own you've already got that guidance there to make it as easy as possible for them to do something impressive without a huge amount of work yeah yeah that's that's definitely the hope um each faction is supposed to give you a different flavor um and then of course with 15 factions you've then got the interactions between all the factions Mm -hmm. you know you can have two factions interacting maybe they like each other maybe they don't Uh you can have three or four factions interacting and and where do the battle lines get drawn where do the alliances get formed and how do these three or four powerful factions sort of clash against each other what does it look like um, there are really loads and loads of opportunities, and as you say, yeah, if you want to do, oh, I'm going to do kind of um, uh, sort of a Walking Dead, um, I'm going to make my own community yeah. thing, um, and you know, we're, we're going to survive as a community against the world, you can mm. do that. Or, you know, maybe you want to go and float out on the on the ocean and do kind of a water world thing, because, you know, that, that appeals. Yeah. Um, you know, you, there, there's a faction that, that lives out on the water because only warm-blooded creatures are infected. So, you know, generally, there are a lot fewer of those in the water um, than there are roaming around on the on the continent. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's still the whales and dolphins and things which are not terribly friendly. But, um, yeah, that it, it, as you say, in the way that Era the Consortium or Era the Chosen we try to offer like these different time periods Mm -hmm. to play in that gives you this different flavor of game era survival does that by factions so yeah absolutely if you want to do all of these various things that we've talked about there are factions for all of that and i've just come out of um of a campaign i was just running one before before we sat down um and uh, I, I included two factions uh, who happened to be allied with each other. And one of those factions was pretending to be a third faction. The, the combinations are virtually limitless. There's so much that you can do. Um, and you can just have all of these different interactions, which I think really makes for a huge variety of stories. See, when you're designing stuff, do you strip stuff out at all or do you just put it all in? I mean, as far as you're concerned, is there merit to kind of like holding back in kind of putting content out there at all or is it just worthwhile kind of having it in there from the very very beginning so that's a really interesting question um because it it really you're fundamentally to me the question you're fundamentally asking is what's an expansion and why wasn't it in there in the first place um um, well, no. What I mean, I'm saying like, is, like when you no, that, that really when you're is, kind of designing the... it, what I'm saying is, do you do you drop? Do you have like a flow chart um, of everything that you want to put in, and then off the back of that, do you then say, right, I'm not going to put this in at all. It's not made the cut. Or are you just like, well, I might as well put all my thoughts down here because someday, even if I don't think it's a hundred percent amazing, somebody else might kind of grab it and run with it, and right, might like really, really enjoy. 
it themselves. So, yeah, yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. Um, basically, you always have limits. Um, Era of the Consortium's first rulebook was 300 pages. I released a definitive edition that was 420 pages, and I didn't even try very hard mm-hmm. to do that. Um, there's there's always stuff that you can't put in because physically the book has to be affordable. Mm-hmm. It has to be printable. It has to be, you know, you know, people have to be willing to pay what it's going to cost to get the book. And if the book costs 300 quid because it's a thousand pages, you're never going to sell that book, unfortunately. <laughs> um you know, it's 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 kind of a case of okay, how long can I actually make this book? And that's a question that I I asked myself when I started Era Survival. Um, I came out with a book that was two hundred and thirty pages long. I did a definitive edition that was three hundred pages long. Um, and now I'm doing source books, and you know, I've done a seventy eight page source book for the Swarm. I've got a similar thing planned for Aqua. That's two of fifteen factions. I I. I I have virtually endless thoughts and material, and I always try to write everything I can down because I never know if I remember it when I come back to it. But I, I unfortunately, I don't find that I can put all of my thoughts down. I'm perhaps too prolific. Um, I, I have to say, okay, this thing, I love it. It's fantastic, but you know what, it's got to be an expansion mm. because it's not needed for the core of the game, right? You can play the game without this. It, it adds a new dimension. It adds extra things you can do. Um, naval combat, right, is something that I've had on my mind since I started Era Survival and came up with the Citizens of Aqua. But completely honestly, it's just not needed in 99% of games. Um, okay, so... I'm going to make a source book for the faction, Aqua, and in that I'm going to include the naval combat rules. Okay, cool. In that case, if you're playing with Aqua, those rules suddenly become a lot more relevant. Yeah, yeah. It matters. Would it have been worth five pages in the rule book? Probably not. Are you still um are you still doing a lot of stuff yourself? I mean, as things kind of grow, are you starting to rely on other people? And then that's a difficult that's a difficult situation because I know a lot of creative people who, when you start to expand and then you're asking more and more people to be involved in your project, there's that kind of, are they going to treat it with the same kind of respect that I would? So, I mean, are you are you getting more kind of people involved in helping you kind of come up with the ideas or is it still pretty much kind of 99% you just sitting down every night and kind of writing and creating stuff so you're you're not wrong um one of the hardest things for me is people will treat something that I take very seriously with Perhaps professional levity is is mm-hmm. the word. It's you know I have no problem with a with a fun working environment. We create games, right? If if we're not having a fun working environment, if we can't have a laugh every so often, and we're probably mm-hmm. doing something wrong. So you know that that's cool. But in terms of you know delivering to deadlines, you know y- y- that's serious. People have invested their money in our Kickstarter. Um, they want to see the thing that they said they were gonna that we said they're gonna get. You know, we've delivered fifty four times. How are we not going to deliver fifty five? Um. So you know, I I think I think it has unfortunately been the case that some of the people I've worked with haven't understood that. Um, and in those cases, I end up in a situation where I have to kind of pick up the slack. And that's certainly not universally true. There are there are people out there. Uh, Jennifer, who's worked with me since Era of the Consortium, was the primary writer on Era Survival uh, originally. Uh, she's been working on more and more stuff with me since then. Chosen, Lost Legend, you name it. She's, she's done tons of stuff. Um, you know, Jennifer, I know that I can hand her a story. We've been working together for six years now, seven years now. Um, and, you know, I know I can hand her a story and I'll get something back. 
I know she's going to take it seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, then again, there have been writers, and I don't want to name any names. I don't want to embarrass anyone. There have been writers I've worked with who, you know, they'll sit on something for a year and then just go, yeah, I'm sorry, I felt I- I'm having some depression issues. I'm sorry I haven't got back to you for a year despite constant emails. I'm not going to be doing this. Thank you. Bye. You know, and, and I, I plan a lot of stuff mm. in the pot uh, in, in, in the future. Um, I have a good pipeline. You know, I, I generally have a very good idea of where something's at um, when I go to Kickstarter. So I know exactly where Aqua's at. I know exactly where Encounters on Route and, and um, Diaries of Madman are at and what I need to do in order mm-hmm. to deliver them. So I think the answer is both. I'm doing a lot of sitting down and working, and some of that is because people don't do the job that they say they're yeah. going to. Um, sometimes it's easier for me to just sit down and do it rather than explain everything for another time to another person I don't know. Are they going to do a good job? Right, I don't okay. know. And and I'm taking a risk. And trying to weigh that up is probably one of the hardest things about trying to scale operations. Um, you know, how do you do three games at once? Well you make sure that two of those three games are practically finished before anyone hears about them, and the third one is underway while you're moving along with the other two. Ah, oh, right, okay. On the publicity yeah, yeah. side. So, you know, at the moment, for example, I have two card games which are literally ready to go. Um, I've playtested them, I've played them at work, I've played them at home, I've played them mm-hmm. with everyone. Everyone's tried them out. Everyone likes them. They're good. They're done. The artwork's finished. I've got a prototype sitting less than two meters away from me. Um, I no one no one knows about them unless they've actually play tested those games. No one knows mm-hmm. anything mm-hmm. about them. Um, and as I'm working on Era Survival, what's going to happen is those games are going to come out. Um, as I'm doing Kickstarter for Era Survival, I'm working on Era Lost Legend, which you and I didn't get to speak about, but I, I ran a Kickstarter for it in October. Um, and, you know, Era Lost Legend uh, has a lot of work to do, a lot of art to do. I'm working through the written stuff that I've got to yeah. do at the same time. So it's it's kind of a case of understanding what the ebb and flow of a project is. And I've learned that over kind of six years of, of running projects. Um, You know, there are times, like when it's on Kickstarter, where there's a limit to what you can do with the project. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm running a lot of games online at the moment. I'm trying to get Kickstarter backers in. I'm trying to get people who are interested in the Kickstarter in. Um, But apart from that, and apart from, like, news posts and so on, and updates on the Kickstarter, which I'm doing every day at the moment, there's not a lot else that I can do. I can sit down with people like yourself, but I'm waiting to schedule those. Um, so in the meantime, I may as well be working on something else because you can't spam everyone all day, every day. It doesn't work, right? You can't market in that way. Um, you can't get people to look at things when you're, when you're screaming at them about it every mm-hmm. single day, people start ignoring you. So, you know, what, what, what I try to do is I try to go, okay, here's the amount of stuff I need to do. Here's the amount of spare time I've got. What am I going to do with that spare time? Okay, I'm going to do some audio drama stuff. I'm going to do some uh, Lost Legends stuff. I'm going to make sure that every time an artist sends in an image to me, everything gets dropped for 10 minutes until I've given feedback on the image and any changes that are needed, because that's always got to be a priority. And and I just kind of compartmentalize tasks in that way. Is it it still as difficult after all this time, after running so many campaigns, after having you know, so many backers to kind of get the word out there. Do you feel, are you feel you're kind of cracking it or do you feel that you're kind of just like, look, we're going to keep putting these out here. They're going to, you know, they continually fund, you know, I'm doing, you know, you're continually reaching your funding targets kind of most, you know, pretty much every time. Um, Mm. Mm. Is it getting any easier? Are you just, are you just, are you kind of like, well, I'm in my niche I know that the people who want to come along and, and, and kind of buy into more era content are quite happy to do that. I mean, are you in a position like, this sounds strange, but are you in the position to to handle kind of like a huge amount of success? Because, I mean, you know, 
one of the things that I've seen. So, like ten thousand backers, what would I do, kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I've known people. I'm not. I've known. I mean, I'm not being funny, but I've known that to break campaigns. I, I, you know, it's certainly. Yeah. You know, I certainly. Um, you know, going. I mean, I certainly known a few campaigns. You know, over the last kind of three, four years, or in fact, I've been involved in Kickstarter for much longer than that, where, you know, not funding is sometimes a better can sometimes be a better problem to have than funding when you've got like five or ten thousand backers because all of a sudden everything becomes very big, very real at the same time, you know. Mm. So I have never had that problem yet. Um I so it, it again that's a really interesting question and something that I've thought about a lot over the years. Um, you know, f- fifty-four Kickstarters. Uh, um, I've everything I've done. I've published eighty-six products um, over the last six years, and everything I've done has been Kickstarter funded. So, what would happen genuinely if I got five thousand backers? All of the stuff that I'm doing, the way that I'm executing it, is designed for kind of maximum maybe five hundred backers. It could be a problem. You know, it, it could be. It could be a way in which I need to learn something new about the way in which I can deliver. That said, I think that I've learned a lot about being more funded than I expected. And um, there have been a few... There have been a few Kickstarters where that's happened to me. Um, the most obvious is the Era of the Consortium expansions, uh, the first Era of the Consortium expansions Kickstarter. Because I offered a stretch goal at too low a number. In reality, that's really what happened. Um, And I didn't understand what it actually meant to produce an expansion for every thousand pounds. And the things that I learned from that adventure have informed me and I've learned to do better. So something like that, yeah, absolutely, you know, there are a few aspects to it. So let's say 10,000 backers hypothetically come in. And I'm looking at stretch goals and I'm going, okay, well, I said initially every thousand. I didn't say every thousand. I said initially it's every thousand because the reality is you have diminishing returns. You don't have so much profit as the um, as the amount gets bigger because yeah. there's so much more time involved in dealing with it. So, you know, you, you start to spread out those stretch goals a little bit as you get to the higher numbers. Okay, cool. Fair enough. Um, How would I deal with the volume of that? I have been approached by a large number of agencies over the years. I actually have in mind how I would do it if it came up. Um, However, I've never reached the point at this stage where it's been Mm -hmm. that. I've looked into US printing options or even China printing options and shipping to the US and to the UK. Or, you know, China printing for the US and then UK printing for the UK and Europe. Uh, And I've looked into all these things just in case one day, you know, 10,000 books happens. I'd like to think I'm as prepared as I can be without it ever having happened. I know that sounds a bit silly in a sense, but um, I think that there are things that you can't know what the actual effect's going to be. There is a level of unpredictability of it when you've never done it. Um, I've read a lot of articles about what people have done in order to deal with this. I've spoken to a lot of people who have had that level of success, um, as indeed, of course, of you many times, I'm sure. And I'd like to believe that I'm prepared for it, if not certain I can handle it. Yeah. If that makes sense. Have you got... um, Off the back of that, do you think this is going to be something you're going to continue to do. I mean, it's like they say, like any kind of relationship, you need to um, continue to make things interesting um, or at least get comfortable enough where you're happy kind of where you are with things. I mean, have you, has there been, or have you ever got to the point where you're kind of like, do you know what, if, I need to take a step back from this completely and I just need to put a lid on it and that's it. And then I can shut the book on this and say, look, I had an excellent, 
you know, five or six years of doing this and then it's time to go on and do something else. I mean, how do you keep the motivation going? How do you, you know, how do you decide to keep going as well? You know, what what kind of makes you, you know, continue to do what you do? I have had universes exploding in my head since I was a fairly young child. Um, I actually designed the Ulutians and the Zimians when I was seven years old. Um, I have more stories to tell, and if I don't tell them, I will not be happy. Mm. So I know that for now, and maybe the pace slows down, you know, I, I can't, you know, maybe I can't keep going at this pace forever, you know, there are going to be other things that happen in my life. Um, I certainly slowed down the pace a bit while I was jobless for a while uh, during 2018. Um, and the pace necessarily slowed. Um, but I think that fundamentally, I am a creator. And I have things that I need to create. And I can point at... I knew, I've known for a while I needed to do more era survival expansions, so, you know, I'm, I'm really glad to have this here now. But I know also I need to do more with Era of the Consortium. You know, I've got this, I've got this kind of, all these little gremlins sitting on my shoulders going, Era of the Consortium, Era Survival, Era the Empowered, Era the Empowered. <laughs> um, and I know that there are things I need to do more with. I must do more with them, and I feel a drive to do more with them because I'm not finished. I'm not done. I've got more to say. I've got more to tell. Um, Era Survival, Era the Consortium, Era the Empowered, Era the Chosen, um, Era Forbidden, uh, still. Um, on the other hand, Era Liars, that gremlin's gone quiet now. That, that, that gremlin really doesn't have anything more mm. to say. The Era Liars Definitive Edition was, was Era Liars has a lid on it now. It's, it's good. It's everything that it ever needs to be. And there's no real need between the Pocket Edition and the Definitive Edition. There's no need to have more. I don't I don't need to create more for that universe. I'm doing some stuff in the era zone which is our zine quest zine. But um you know I'm doing some taverns and I'm doing some bits and pieces but I don't have this desperate pressing need to make more for era liars anymore. And I imagine that as I move forward I mean the same is true of uh era balam or era hitman some of our some of our pocket games. I feel like what they are is all they need yeah. to be. Um, but there are also more games I need to do. I've had a cyberpunk game. I've had a high fantasy game. Uh, the high fantasy game I've had for seven years and I haven't made any progress on it because I just, I haven't sat down and done it yeah. yet. Um, because there are always other things to do. Um, I've got the cyberpunk game, which I came up with about three or four years ago. I've got these card games that I, I just mentioned and I've got four or five more ideas for card games. Um, I'm actually getting some maths help, some quantitative analyst help on uh, uh, on one of my card games because I need to make sure that it's not solvable easily. Um, Battlecruiser Alamo. I don't really feel a massive need to do more. There's more I could do, but right now I don't. I don't feel a desperate need. Um, so I think I think it varies from game to game, and I think that there are games. Era of the Consortium is never going to be done. I'm I'm never going to finish it. Um, and I've kind of come to terms with that. I know I'll always be adding to it. And, and if I stop adding to it, I know I won't be finished. Um, I think Era the Empowered can be finished. It's just not. I think Era Survival can be finished. And I actually have a pretty good idea of what that scope looks like. Because at minimum, it looks like the all of the expansions that we've planned, which is about 20. All right, okay. Um, and, and maybe when I get to the end of that 20, it looks done. I'm I'm not really sure, um, but I know I need to do a faction source book for each of the factions, right? And I've done two as of this Kickstarter being funded out of fifteen, <laughs> so I've got a ways you've to go. Got, you've got um, to work out. You work out for you basically. Indeed, yeah. But I don't I don't need to finish this year. You know that that's that's the thing, and that's the key for me. I can do something on Era Survival. I can go away and I can give people a year or two or even three to digest it. And then I can come back and do some more. 
And over that time, the whole of the era system is being recognised by more people, is being played by more people. I release another game in a new genre. I do Lost Legend, uh, which is kind of Final Fantasy-esque. Suddenly, there's a whole new set of people who are hearing about this because they're interested in that genre. And maybe they are interested in sci-fi or survival horror or superheroes. But they hear about it through the new genre I mean, that I'm going creating. Forward, are you not are you ever tempted to do anything completely completely different or are you always going to be like a storyteller i yeah um when you say completely different i mean i i don't have any plans to go out and invent uh, a cushion you know uh that's the most comfortable cushion anyone's ever have you thought on. about I, home I don't baking. you know that's it's not really on my home baking <laughs> or hiking macram macrami uh, home Macrame. I'm 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 gonna say no because my wife is an expert and and she'd just embarrass me the whole uh, time. Macrame. What I have done though, uh, oh, home right, baking. Okay. I'm not sure about macrame. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how, how how good she is. Um, but what I have done and I've done this recently is I've started um giving some of my attention to helping people learn to write. And and I don't mean, you know, like like the very very basics, you know, um but what is a good sentence structure? What are plot clichés and how should you avoid them and why was it okay when Neil Gaiman did that? <laughs> um and 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 you know, what what why was that all right? Why can't I do it yeah. as well? Or you know, why why can't you do any more, Luke, I am your father? Why can't you do that? Why doesn't it work? <laughs> yeah. Right? Um, you know, and, and sort of aspects of, of how to be creative. Um, it's something that uh, Jonathan Lewis, who's one of my great friends, uh, one of my longtime collaborators, it's something that he and I started doing as panels at conventions. And I've actually sat down and I've written an A6 book. I'm holding it right now. I'm holding the proof. Um, I've written a six book, which is a, a choose your own adventure, right? But what it is, is as you go through, um, there are various sort of writing style bloopers. All right. So you'll go in and you'll have a he said, she said, he said, she said, he said, she said. And then I'll go, by the way, you lost this adventure. You died. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Uh, you know, you, you lose, start again. And here's why that didn't work. And here are the things that you should try to do to try and avoid it. Um, and I did this. It's whole. It's all. It's all based around the 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 journey of a superhero. Um, just just for the sake of argument, her name is Libby, and she has the power to super jump. Right. Um, because that's what I decided to do. And it's kind of a light hearted attempt to bring people into a method of storytelling and plot creation. And it doesn't just apply to superhero stories. It applies to everything. And it's it's sort of uh, it's sort of. It's supposed to be a bit of fun, and it's supposed to be helpful and educational. And it's supposed to bring that... Oh, I tried to do that, and someone said it yeah. didn't work. But they couldn't say why, it, they just said it didn't work. You know, my hope would be that I'd cover it, and I'd say, okay, look, here is the reason that that didn't work, and you shouldn't do that, because, you know, I am your father, it's become a cliché, it's no longer a surprise the way it was in Empire. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right? Exactly. You know, no, no one expected that to be the thing, but now, the villain being the, the hero's dad is like, oh my god, really, again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So, you shouldn't do it unless you're a very experienced writer who knows how to put a twist on it. Just avoid that particular cliché and come up with something else instead. Alright. Okay. Well, that sounds all cool. Um, so that that's what I mean by like learning to write, and that's something you're going to continue to do as long as people. Um, it's something I've recently started. I would I'd like to keep doing it. I've been doing panels on it for oh goodness, um, seven years oh, now. Right. Okay. Uh, sort of four or five panels a year. Um. So, you know, I've been talking about this kind of thing and world building and how you build your own universe and why a timeline's important and all this kind of stuff. I've been doing this for quite a while. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm planning to continue doing it. Yeah. Cool. cool. Um, going back to era survival, mm -hmm. how much is it to get involved? What's the pledge levels? How much, how much money do people have to hand you in order to get involved in the campaign and support you guys? 
So, um, to get involved is actually really not very expensive. You can get the Era Survival Rulebook Primer for three pounds. Um, that will give you everything you need to play the game. It's got the basics. It's got a little bit for the GM to help you out. It's compatible with all the expansions. Um, it's got the full rule set. It's got tiers one to five of items, um, which is everything that you can have as a newly created character. You aren't allowed above mm-hmm. that. So, you know, it's it's got everything you need to get started. Three pounds for digital. Um... If you want to get the expansions alone, because you know Era Survival and you've got you've got it already, um, that's fifteen pounds for every single expansion that we unlock. At the moment, that's three. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could easily be four or five or six. You'll get everything in digital format. Um, you've got, uh, uh, and then um, if you're new to Era Survival, you like digital books. You know, you want you want it in digital format. I know some people who have no more space on their shelves for role-playing games, which I think is a tragedy, but it is the way it is. Um, £30. (laughs) £30 will net you the Era Survival Definitive Edition, Uh which is like the ultimate rulebook, if you like, um, plus all of the expansions that we've already produced and all the new expansions as well. Um, And if you're more of a a physical book person, I am. I'm, I'm a physical book person. Um, you can get the core rulebook and uh, three expansions in printed format for sixty-five pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, that's actually a, that's a discount off what it would uh, be like if you bought it from us on the store at a convention. Um, it would be seventy. So we, you know, we're, we're trying to discount stuff. We we want people to join in. Um, you also, as well as those three expansions in paperback, you get to choose which ones we which ones you want in paperback, but you get everything in digital still. That's Everyone cool. gets everything in digital. That's cool. That's cool. Um, and you can get, you know, you can go all the way up to kind of the collector's edition full set. Um, at the moment, it's £140. That gives you the definitive edition hardback. It gives you all of the expansions to date and future um, in the same sort of cover. So they make a set. Um, and... Uh, that will actually increase in price as we make more books, right? So if, you know, because you get all of the expansions, um, 140 now will get you everything, um, but it might end up being 180 if we unlock enough expansions that we need to do more than one book, right? So it'll be a new book. Um, so that tier will get closed off and make a new one um, if that happens. So yeah, I mean, there's there's a fair variety. We actually made, um, uh, I actually went out and made a graphic um, uh, which is right at the top of the right at the top of the campaign under the quick intro to to era survival. Um, stuck. Here is our handy guide to the reward tiers. So you know, I'd like to try it out. You know, there are a couple of examples of of where you can get stuff. Yeah. I already own it. <laughs> so if you're one of those, then you know, oh, here's how you get the expansions. Right. Um, I prefer everything digital. You know, that's the the thirty pound yeah, tier yeah, I just yeah. mentioned. Yeah. I want everything the world can offer. You know, um, how do you get that if you're brand new to it? Or indeed, you're a collector. Um, And I've tried to guide people through the tiers because one of the things I'm very aware of with Kickstarter is because I've run so many, because Era Survival is now on its second expansions Kickstarter, there are basically three groups of people. There are the ones who've never heard of Era Survival before and, and are interested. There are the ones who have the core rulebook. Maybe they bought it from us at a convention and they don't really use Kickstarter very often or or maybe they back the first Kickstarter and not the second one. Um, so they need to catch up the everything in the meantime but not, you know, but, but not get the core rulebook mm. again because they've already mm. got it. And then the third group of people are people who have everything to date and just want the new stuff. So I've kind of got to cater for all of those people, and that really is a challenge when it comes to Kickstarter, because you end up with loads and loads of reward tiers. I've only got nine on this project. I don't think that's that many, <laughs> but um, it's a it, it is. It, uh, it 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 is. I mean, it is. But I I feel the need to cater to everyone. I don't want anyone to walk away from this Kickstarter no, disappointed. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, but you also want people not only walking away not disappointed, but maybe wanting to walk away from you but then loop back so that they can maybe try and then consider following you down the street. So if people wanted to follow you on the internet webs, where do we find you on the internet web, Ed? 
So there are a few places. Um, right now, uh, like if you're listening to this right now, the best place to find me is on Discord. Um, because I'm on Discord and I'm running games every single day. So, um, you know, go ahead and join me on Discord. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll put the link in the show notes. Um, there's obviously the website, www.shadesofvengeance.com. Um, we are on Facebook, uh, which is facebook.com slash shades of vengeance. Uh, we are on Twitter, uh, which is at shades underscore of underscore venge. Um, and we're the same as that on Instagram, uh, shades underscore of underscore venge. Uh, character limits. They're very annoying. <laughs> they really are. Um, really long business yeah. names. They're really annoying. Uh, yeah, well... Um, they really are. Yeah. Just say uh, yeah. Just throw them back at you. Yeah. I, I mean, that's that's probably a fair comment. I mean, I, I'm actually somewhat annoyed by it from time to time because I do have to spell my email address from time to time. Yes. Um, and shadesofvengeance.com is, is, is a lengthy spell. It is. So it's your own fault. Um, I'm just saying. And of course on Kickstarter. You can find us we'll on make Kickstarter. Sure that we we make well. sure we put that link, that important link in the show notes so that we've got notes to show. Uh, that, that's quite an important it one is, for me. It yeah. is. If you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, just go into the We Are Not Wizards in the Googles and you'll find us because we're just everywhere. We're impossible not to find now. Um, there you go. Yeah. Really? Impossible. Impossible. Challenge accepted. There you go. Um, and you'll find us on Instagram and Facebook, and we've got our website and we've got our blog where we write about stuff, and we've got our YouTube and we've got our Twitter and every single lovely place where you can sit in isolation and just devour our content. If you like what you've listened to tonight, then consider dropping us a subscription on your podcast catcher of choice. If you like us even more than that, then consider going to the Apple podcasts where we usually feature in the top 100 because we're, um, you know, because eventually even Apple... Decidedly average. Well, eventually even <laughs> Apple gives up trying to stop you. Um, and if you like us a lot, give us a rating or a review. And as we say as always, what do we do? What do we say, Ed? Don't give us... We say don't give us 10 yep. stars. Because we're not outstanding. Don't give us zero yeah. because you'll make Richard that's cry. Right. Although I think you, you know, that's quite funny. Yeah. So consider it. Yeah. Um, okay. But give us five stars because we're decidedly average. It's in the middle. Yeah. We're just a little bit average. But is is it? Yeah. Is that is that not that about is right? Completely correct. You're absolutely joyous. Um, yeah. And he's there absolutely. He's he's not only <laughs> joyous. He's ed joyous or ed education. Joyous. Ed, Ed Joe, he's education joyous. Is Ed Joe? Um, check out his Kickstarter. Check out, check out how to survive in this era, as he would say. Um, <clears throat> there's only two more things to do. We know that Ed's not a wizard because he always says he's not a wizard. Sometimes I'm not. Um, I thought that. And the second, no, I'm a science fiction god with all technology I'm uh, um, sorry what no okay and the second thing is to say say goodbye Ed so uh, say goodbye Ed bye and it's a bye from me remember stay safe rule six is make something awful and if you fancy expanding your horizons into the unknown part do you then get yourself on a kickstarter and search for era survival and you shall find it and you shall pledge its very reasonable levels and you shall have a fantastic day but until the next time, goodbye. Thank you for listening, everyone. Say goodbye, Ed. Bye. A wizard is never late. Is he early? He arrives precisely when he means to. Mm-hmm.